we actually are big Shakespeare fans, and my daughter, who's 12, is in a Shakespeare production of Romeo and Juliet. That Get been out working of here. On. Yeah, so they've been working on it since August, and they'll, uh, they'll actually do it in May, and they'll have like seven or eight performances. And so it's, you know, from high school all the way down to uh, middle school, and these are just a bunch of homeschool kids that do, will do Shakespeare performances. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, she loves wow. it. She she went out and she 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 looked at the character list. She she saw all this stuff and she's like, I want to be the nurse. I want to be the nurse. And I think I have fun. And she went completely all into it. Brought pops to the um, audition and she got it. She got the nurse. And so, and she wants she wow. wanted to be a nurse. And so now she's a nurse in Romeo and Juliet. Man, and then remember those lines for the rest of your life. You know, whenever you learn that stuff. Oh, she, her memory is just ridiculous. I mean, I, I, I can't remember where I parked my car. It's, it's somewhere around here. Um, but she's just just steel trap. And I'm like, you don't get that from me. That's for damn sure. Well, folks, feel free to get in your technical questions. We'll go through your technical questions. First come, first serve. And uh, just as they come in, no one's even typed any in this week. Yeah, we it's wide open noise. today. It's like, damn, <laughs> yeah, rich here. Well, what are we going to ask about? I already know right, what like, index is. What? The, pe- the people no, with the real brains, Eric yeah. and Tara, are out uh, actually making money bringing in uh, client dough. So while Eric, while uh, Richie and I get to go goof off. and Yeah, the cost centers are here. <laughs> <laughs> Sad but true. Um, oh, Michael Tilly asks, uh, any interesting holiday SQL server or other reading? The big thing that's going on right now, and I should pop the uh, my my whoopsie, pop my uh, web browser open for it is uh, the register. There we'll go get the register. So there's a really big CPU bug uh, going out. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and I don't have an I don't oh, I don't have an ad blocker on this VM, so of course I'm not going to find it. Uh, let's see here. So Intel CPU flaw. There's a problem with, uh, I don't really want to click on the Guardian, but it's the top one up there. So I guess that's what I'm going to take. Um, there's a huge security flaw that got found in all recent, like over the last 10 years, Intel processors. And they are uh, Microsoft, Linux, uh, Apple, everybody are working on patches as we speak. Uh, But it's going to involve a hit of, say, 20 to 30 percent max on system calls from applications. Um, So people are worried about the classic examples databases that constantly have to write to the transaction log, uh, that that could get 20 to 30 percent slower. Uh, so that's that's been the big thing that I've been reading about lately. Kind of interesting. Woo! Slower yeah. databases. Give us a call. Oh. We can help you out with that. Man, sadly we can. And it's funny because just uh, you know, you think about things that you don't have to worry usually worry about, and people are like, "Oh my God!" Now I'll have to. Our cloud prices will suddenly get thirty percent higher. And I don't think that they will. I think that the the cloud vendors are going to suck that up in order to keep you, you know, work in the cloud. As, otherwise, just one of the vendors would do a price cut while everybody else tried to do a raise, and then you would just consider switching over. Yep. Yep. The the um, other news that uh, that I saw was um, someone had wrote a and I don't have a link or anything like that. Again, I don't know where my car is, and I'm sitting here at home. <laughs> um, the, someone did a really great write up about um, Docker. And essentially said that this is like the, the 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 year that Docker failed, and kind of went through all the bullet points of what happened this year with the Docker and the company, and not necessarily bashing the technology, but bashing the company in, in itself. Uh, and that was a super good read. I think I retweeted it. So I don't know, go to my Twitter feed if you want really interested in and scroll through all the, you know, Zelda crap that I've been tweeting about. <laughs> it, it did. It sounded like they fumbled a lot of political things really badly, and yep. the technology is neat. Like I just started last week using Docker on my Mac Pro at home, just because almost all of the the development that I do in testing, I start by restoring the Stack Overflow database or restoring a yep. client's database. So I'm like, at the end of the day, who cares? I don't need persistence, so a Docker container works okay. Um, but then the first time I tried to run into troubleshooting, I ran into all kinds of problems. I'm like, how do you troubleshoot a headless Docker container? That, 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. That. I mean, that's, I mean, I go straight to, you know, folks like Cecil Phillip, who's used it a ton and, and things like that. And I, I'm still trying to grok a lot of stuff because I know a lot of people, you know, love to put their dev tools in Docker containers and things like that. And I'm like, I don't need that, right? I mean, I could just do an install of my computer and it's going to lay, lay there until I kill the, the machine. I mean, that's, so I get a new machine and it's there, so. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions asked just now, I should go look and see who the name was. Uh, Garland says, any places, suggestions to on look to looking up, setting up Linux containers with persistent storage on a Windows host? Generally, I wouldn't recommend Docker containers on a Windows host, especially now if you're dealing with persistent storage, just do a VM and that, that's exactly what you're looking for. Um, but I do have good resources on for a Mac where, you know, I don't, I don't run Windows in a VM if I can avoid it, just in terms of a performance overhead. Now, Aaron Bertrand, if you Google for Aaron Bertrand, SQL Server Linux, he has a great specific walkthrough of exactly everything that you need to do in order to uh, install it. So it's really super nicely done. Uh, but I, otherwise, I just really wouldn't recommend it on Windows. It doesn't make sense. Uh, Rob asks, in a Win 2016, SQL 2016, always on availability group with three nodes, is are distributed transactions supported between the nodes and necessary? Also with a three node, no specific, blah, 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 blah. so distributed transactions are real <laughs> with uh, always on availability groups. So if you search for SQL Server always on availability groups, distributed transactions, there's a huge list of gotchas around differences between 2016, 2017, whether databases can be in the same uh, availability group or different availability groups. This uh, post will get you into all kinds of details here. It's really fun. Basically, 2017 supports distributed transactions for databases and availability. 2017 supports this. 2016 did, but only as long as the distributed transactions were going across two different, two or more different databases on different AGs on different nodes. You couldn't do a distributed transaction across two databases on the same node. So that's kind of hairy there. Uh, let's see what's next. Um, uh, James May says, do you take submissions for bad IG, idea genes posts? That's probably the only thing that we would take submissions for. We have a soft spot in our heart for bad idea genes with SQL Server, but uh, Mike's... <laughs> Mike's... <laughs> so many bad ideas <laughs> slow you right there. I mean... <laughs> And Richie sees it from being in the in the in the, the company chat room. We sit there and we just have the worst ideas all day long about how to do something. And, and you know, I'm usually heads down, right? So you know, I'm, I'm I'm typically behind the real time of Slack. And I raise my head. It's like, what is going on? It's just all terrible. Stop. And he gets to see highlights from client, you know, code will show something like, check out what this does. Oh, why would you ever do that? Yeah, yeah. I think I was razzing you earlier because your comment on one of the clients was, oh, I bet you it's missing indexes. And I'm like, it's always misses, ain't missing indexes, Brent. It's always that with you. It's it's funny, Yeah. And it's, there's some things that you can pretty much guarantee are going to show up during a critical care. Just like there's some things you can guarantee will show up during an office hours. The Errol and Summer Scoggs post slow in the app fast in SSMS. It's going to happen. Yeah, that's a seven minutes there. Thanks. Eight, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mike asks, SPLA licensing. My management manager is talking about this, but there isn't much online about it. Do you know anything about this licensing model? Yes. So if you are going to be a service provider, if you're going to sell access to SQL Server to other people, like if you're going to have an application that uses SQL Server as a back end, people are going to query SQL Server directly. You're going to be a service provider or a software provider. You basically rent your application license or rent your SQL Server licensing by the month. Um, pricing is all totally down to what you negotiate with Microsoft. They publish a guide about it. Resellers get involved. 
um, but generally you have to go talk to a reseller. The nice part that I love about it is it's every, because it's every month, you can change capacity. Normally as a performance tuner, unless you're like, you know, Richie and I working in the cloud, if you do a whole bunch of performance tuning and you cut your workloads, you don't get a refund the next month. You know, you can't suddenly cut your bill, but with SPLA licensing, you can. That's cool. I didn't know they could do that. Yeah, every single month changes. So you can all of a sudden go bum rush with a brand new client and you know be lit up in the next month. Wow. Terry says, we have several SQL Server Enterprise Edition, woohoo, um, 2014 and 2016 servers with nightly scheduled index reorg maintenance. Should I forego reorganizing my indexes and just do rebuilds considering we have enterprise? The Big problem is transaction log activity. When you go rebuild indexes from scratch, you're building a whole new copy of the object. It's a logged activity, which means your log backups grow, your transaction log file may grow, depending on how quickly you take log backups. It's more data that you send to your mirrors, always on availability group replicas. Um, so it's, it will tend to just inflate the amount of transaction log activity. Um, that's the only big con I can think of. Uh, we, I'm kind of known for saying you should le ease up on the index maintenance period because it's not like people really go, oh my God, it's suddenly faster now. But if you have the luxury of a maintenance window to do it and you want to do it, it's not so bad. Oh, okay, so one other thing. It does, it does um, it's called online index rebuilds, but it's not 100% online. At the end of the operation, it has to swap in the newly rebuilt index and you can end up with a uh, schema mod lock uh, on that. And so non or queries with no lock actually get blocked behind that. So uh, just be careful around that. Daryl says, I know I need to live in SQL Server Health Check. I, I, Daryl, I think you're missing a verb there. Um, he says, I don't have a stress check process in place. What's a good starting place to address replica timeouts in availability groups? I pushed and pushed on our storage guy, and our vendor finally admitted we had saturated the SSDs. Um, <laughs> when you finally get the storage vendor to admit anything, consider it a success. You have won the day. Go home uh, victorious. Yeah, and I would want to know more about what the what specifically uh, validated the or what what specifically he meant by saturated the SSD because this is kind of longer than something we could quickly address over office hours. I'd say he's saying I went through your SQL Server health checklist. Yeah, so that we really published pages of stuff on how to do that. Then to dig even deeper, that's where our consulting comes in. So it's it's kind of beyond what I could answer quickly. You will notice as the slide deck goes through, you'll see a place to post multi-paragraph questions at Stack Exchange. That could be one place that you would start. Just make sure to zoom in as closely as possible and define your question. I'm not exactly sure what you mean by the question here. AG replica timeouts, be more specific about exactly what the error message is that you're getting, um, what problem it's causing, because it may not be that big of a deal. If you're doing synchronous replicas between two places, the first thing I'd ask is, how much unnecessary maintenance are you doing, like index rebuilds all the time? If you're doing big, huge chunks index rebuilds in a synchronous AG, that's a great reason to run into problems. Oh man, Garland has a fun question. He says, referencing your post on the GDPR, was I correct in understanding that if there's any data from the EU held in the DB, you need to be in compliance? So this is pretty tricky. One of the things that causes a problem is if you have an EU citizen, now I, I should say first, I'm not a lawyer. I don't provide legal advice. I don't provide compliance advice. I'm only going to relay things to you the way that I understand it and the way that our attorneys have, have come to understand it for us. If a European citizen gives you data and you take it as some kind of data processor, you're going to do something with it. You're going to send them emails. You're going to analyze their data. You're going to build a report with their data they have the right to be forgotten. 
so the GDPR is this new regulation for EU citizens where an EU citizen can contact you as their data processor and say, I would like to exercise my right to be forgotten. You have to delete all of their relevant data that you don't need for your own legal purposes. So for example, let's say that I sell an EU citizen a piece of training. I have to keep some of that data to track that I sold him or her something for training, how much tax I paid, where he was at the time, but I have to uh, do track what I delete, what I keep, why I'm allowed to keep it. And then if that person goes and contacts the EU, files a complaint, the EU can ask for my audit records and they have to be able to see everything that I've deleted. It gets even tricker, trickier when I start to look at uh, backups. So there's some debate going on now about it may even include having to delete data from my backups or have some kind of auditable script that the instant a backup is restored, I can guarantee that their data is expurred, expunged out of there. So, so, so even, even me thinking about that, you know, and, and we don't have a lot of systems here. I mean, we're, we're, we're pretty small potatoes and stuff like that. So we're using cloud-based systems kind of all over the place. And even just looking at some of the, 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 the newer database stuff, like in RDS Aurora, it some, does an automatic backup. Where does it go, right? How do I have access to it? And, and what, how, how do I even delete stuff inside that backup? You know, there's, there's a lot of questions. For a small company like us, well, how would we even approach something like that? Yeah. And then I also have to guarantee it for, like all of us have laptops, we have desktops. Um, and then that means that we also have to uh, have some kind of written process where every employee certifies that they've you know, made sure that no, they don't have any copies of anybody's private data, anything like that. And it's easy to argue, well, we should just, you should never use production data in development, for example. Um, well, it's, it's kind of easier said than done. It's uh, especially when you're as small as us and we do things like a mailing list where we'll keep lists of customers, uh, what they've clicked on, you know, so that we can tailor content better for them. You'll know from our mailing list for uh, our Monday morning newsletters, we track the 10 most popular clicked on things and we send you out confirmations of those at the end of the year. Hey, here's what people really like to click on. Well, that's got people's data. In it. That means like, yep. we got to be really careful with it. It sucks. Uh, Daryl says, a connection timeout, so Daryl's following up with his availability group piece. He says, a connection timeout has occurred uh, from one replica to another, either a networking issue or a availability replica has transitioned to the resolving role. Typically, when I've seen that happen, it's been that a replica is just completely overwhelmed, that it's like this, the solid state is, or not solid state, but usually magnetic storage is frozen. There's just, it's taking 15 second timeout errors. So it's typically due to under-provisioned hardware. Uh, Eric says, I inherited a few SQL servers with an IBM 7000 fiber channel SAN. All my drives are in RAID 5. Their SAN admin said that solid state drives are not available. What should I do next? My TempDB latency is horrible. Well, this is actually pretty easy. You just go get a couple of local solid state drives and you put them in the, in the SQL server. So if you're running on about bare metal, so like rack mounted boxes, blade servers, etc., you can just put really cheap commodity SSDs inside the blades or rack mounted servers themselves. If you're dealing with uh, virtualization, then you don't have that as an option. Everything's out on the SAN. And it just kind of is what it is. It's one of those things that you make a note of for when users are complaining. Make, just because users are, or just because TempDB latency sucks doesn't mean users are complaining either. Um, a classic thing, we see really slow TempDB all the time with end user systems, and it's just, uh, or with, uh, with production servers, but it's just CheckDB is running in the middle of the night and TempDB sucks then, but no one's actually complaining. Not quite so bad. Um, yeah, so back on the GDPR stuff, I mean, it's so what the, for those of you who aren't uh, hip with that, what that ended up meaning was that we decided uh, not to sell training classes to EU folks. It's so hard because a, a person from the European Union can be standing on American soil 
using a Chinese credit card? You know, how do you make for doggone sure that it's actually someone from the EU? So what we're working with, uh, with the plug-in vendor is to say basically a little checkbox that yes, I verify that I'm not subject to GDPR regulations um, just to make sure that I, we can't ever erase all risk. We can't make sure that somebody from the EU doesn't send us an execution plan with personally identifiable data in it. And we, you know, at that point, we just got to do our best. Pace the plan is a great example of that. And it's something that we just have to think of. Um, and people do ask us to delete their data out of Pace the Plan from time to time, and we do that. Yeah, and after we have in our instructions say we will not delete stuff from Pace the Plan, we still will delete stuff from Pace the Plan. I think the other yeah. thing with it, it, it's, it is the whole GDPR thing is, is so vague. Um, nobody really knows what it means right now. I, I think if, you know, over time they, you know, enhance it a little bit to where we know exactly where our risk is, we probably would take a look at that and uh, oh, yeah. maybe open that back up again. But I, because it's so vague right now and it has such a huge risk uh, for for a small company like us, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I agree with your decision just to, to cut our losses and, and, and be done with it until the EU can figure out what exactly does GDPR mean. There'll be court cases that set precedents. Um, it'll be it'll start to become normal about what you are expected to do, what you're not expected to do. More third-party vendors, WooCommerce, Automatic will start uh, selling tools that make it easier to be compliant with GDPR, and we'll be knocking the door right back down to start letting European people get back into training again as soon as we just have a better idea from the government what those yep. court cases will look like, what we need to do to be compliant. I just don't yeah. want to be the cat in that. They're the canary in that coal mine. I, I think they're they're good laws, and then there's good yeah. laws poorly written, and I yeah. think this is kind of one of those things. I think this is a good law, but it's just so extremely vague that you know how what, what is our even our responsibility, you know, as as a corporation dealing with EU, no, and nobody could tell us, and that's that's part of the problem. Is that we, we, we can't quantify our risk, and whenever you can't quantify, gosh, I'm a, I sound like a project manager. When you can't quantify your risk, then it's an ultimate re super high risk, you know. So, and especially when we quantified the the reward side of it, it's it's less than five percent of our revenue. So I was like, eh, yeah. mm, it's not really worth it. Michael Tilly adds, he said, by the way, GDPR enforcement doesn't go live until twenty fifth of May. Yeah, but you don't want to wait till then to try and become compliant because, you know, you got to start uh, laying your groundwork long in advance of that. Uh, let's see here. Bob says, do you guys have any advice on patching for instances that share databases from multiple applications? So he has like one SQL server that hosts probably SharePoint, Dynamics, you know, whatever. Um, so uh, CL or blah, 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 blah. Cumulative updates come out every 60 days, and what I'll do is go through the list of updates that come out in each cumulative update, all the hot fixes. We point and laugh at it in the company chat room, like incorrect results bug, bug that causes crashing. And so what I'll just send those out to is my application owners and say, all right, everybody, here's the risks. Are you uh, cool with incorrect results coming out of your queries? And then usually that's pretty much the end of it right there. People yep. go, no, I'm not okay with incorrect results. <laughs> then you should stop using no lock. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, God. So sad. Next up, let's see here. We have Paul says, I was always under the guidance that if a table does not have a clustered index, then rows being deleted will not free space in the file. It depends. So uh, if you have a lock escalation, if your huge delete, delete statement involves an escalation up to a table level lock, and you're not under RCSI, for example, you will get the rows cleaned up out of there. Eric Darling just published a blog post yesterday on this, yesterday or two days ago. So if you go to branozar.com slash blog, uh, and today's was the Terra's post on network issues or thread pool weights. If I scroll down a little further, here's this post from Eric Darling, heaps, deletes, and optimistic isolation levels. 
So you can read that. He's even got demo scripts to show you that you can walk through. Um, he's, uh, Paul continues, I have not found this to be true on my table with two columns. PK is int. Well, as soon as you say PK, I start to worry about it. Uh, I wonder if you really do have a clustered index or if you have a non-clustered primary key, which is fairly unusual. Um, yeah, by default, you get the clustered index, though. So. Whenever you declare something as a primary key. Yeah. He says, why is this, or better yet, when do you lose space in a table with no clustered index? Yeah, it's just the SQL Server by default doesn't deallocate pages in a heap. And probably the easiest way to show you to you is just fire up a stack over, fire up a database and give you an example here. Um, so I'm going to go grab a, a presentation script so that I can show you. Uh, to do, 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 do. And of course, it's not name matches heap. Where is the script? Come on now. How? Hold on a second. Open shown and closing folder. Where is this? Heaps and clustered indexes. Never type in a demo. All right, here we go. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to create a table that I'm going to call heaps of sadness. Um, so this is a table with no clustered index. Um, I'll even zoom in a little so you guys can see this, uh, see the T-SQL bigger. I'm creating a table with an identity field. It's not declared as a primary key. It's not, there's no cluster index on this table. And then I'm dumping in about a quarter million rows from the table sys messages. Whenever you want a whole bunch of garbage fast, sys mass messages is one of the fastest ways to get it. Then I'm going to go run SP Blitz index. And the important thing out of SP Blitz index is that it shows me the heap and the size of it. The size of this thing is about a quarter million rows, and it's 2.1 gigs in size. What I'm going to do next is go delete a thousand rows out of it a hundred times. Basically, I'm simulating insert, update, and delete activity going out across this heap. Well, just specifically delete activity. I'm doing this a hundred times. Um, I'm not deleting the entire table in one fell swoop, just deleting randomly a thousand rows across a hundred times each. When that finishes, I'm going to go through and run SP Blitz Index again and see how big heaps of sadness is. Remember, it was 279,000 rows at 2.1 gigs. Now it's 179,000 rows at 2.1 gigs. So these pages are still allocated, even though in some cases there's no rows on those pages. And when you think about what a heap is for, it kind of makes sense. Everything in SQL Server in heaps is stored in 8K pages. Well, SQL Server wants to keep these 8K pages lying around so that you can go insert data into them again quickly. Heaps are fantastic when you dump a bunch of data into a database and then yank all the data right back out again. Nightly uh, staging tables for data warehouses is a great example of that. Just much less useful when you're trying to do insert, update, and delete activity concurrently like we're doing here. When this thing finishes, I'm doing this delete uh, 200 times this time so that I can delete out that last 179,000 rows. And then when it finishes, we'll go through and run SP Blitz index again. You'll already know based on uh, the, the spec of this demo so far, this thing is not going to be a zero space used for that table. Um, so for those of you who are just learning that for the first time, does it make sense to have heaps? Sure, as staging tables in data warehouses where every day you dump all the data in and then you pull it all back out in one quick fell swoop. Makes perfect sense there. So now here I am with my heap, zero rows and 1.6 gigs in space. And I know what you're thinking. Who cares if it's still got a lot of pages attached? It's not like I'm going to shrink my database and reclaim those pages anyway. Well, here's why you care. If I turn on set statistics IO, which Richie is intimately familiar with, and then I go run select star from heaps of sadness, 
if I look at how many logical reads we had to do to execute this query, SQL Server reads 200,000 8K pages every time this query runs, just trying to see if there's any rows in heaps of sadness. Are there any now? I better go check all 200,000 pages again. What about now? I better go check again. If you really want those pages deallocated, you either need to do a delete with tab lock, you need to truncate the table, those, those are both good ways, or do an alter table rebuild, all of those will get you your rows back. Space. 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 No, exactly. Get you your space back. It would be hilarious if they got you your rows back. Yeah. <laughs> what? How did I deleted this data? Why is it back? It's kind of like me, uh, <laughs> me testing this uh, uh, updater tool yesterday. Why won't this update? I don't understand. <laughs> so that'll be the last thing uh, we'll do before we break for today. Uh, speaking of getting your data back, uh, let's call this my table. I'm going to build a table variable. Call it my table and table we're going to put in here id int identity one one person name bear care 50. i'm going oops, one more parentheses insert into my table person name values richie rump then we're going to add me into oops add me into there as well copy paste so we're going to put Richie and I sitting in a table variable, insert kissing joke here, uh, select star from my table. Now y'all know when I declare a table variable and I insert two rows into it and then I select them back out, I'm going to get both me and Richie. Watch when I do this. Begin tran and then roll back. I'm going to insert our rows inside a transaction, but then I'm going to roll them back and then execute my select. When I execute this, I still get our data. Table variables ignore transactions. So you can do a begin tran, dump a bunch of stuff into a table variable, roll it back, it's still in that table variable. Speaking of getting your data back out of nowhere, so Itzik Ben Gan has this great presentation where he calls it bug or feature. He shows you something, and then you have to guess whether this is a bug or a feature. In many cases, it's kind of both. It's just whether you're aware of it ahead of time. If you're aware ahead of it at time, then it's called a feature. So here, it's the perfect example fix. for that. Close won't fix by design. It, this makes sense for those of us who do nightly warehouse data, big loading stored procedures, where I want to write lots of status messages into something, and then if my transaction explodes, I still want the status messages from the whole entire way. I can insert them into a table variable as I go along. Then, because they're impervious to rollbacks, I can still get the stuff out of the table variable at the conclusion of my stored procedure. Somebody in here was asking about bad idea genes. There's your bad idea genes for the day. Well, thanks everybody for hanging out with us at this office hours and we will see y'all next week. Adios.